there's a book that's been on my radar for quite a while now and um, I finally looked up at work from our suppliers to see how much it would cost to get it in to find that they only had one copy left in stock. So I instantly put a direct order in straight to our shop and bought a copy of this beautiful book. In the beginning was The Sea by Thomas Gonzalez. Now from the get-go, I had a lot of faith in this book. It's published by Pushkin Press, who I have read a few of their books before and absolutely adored. So I've enjoyed The Boy Who Stole a Tiller's Horse from them before, um, and I really enjoyed their Spring Garden and Record of a Night Too Brief from their Japanese authors collection. And so whenever I see a cover of theirs which just stands out against everything, I always know that this is going to be a book that I am going to enjoy. And this one was no different. <laughs> So this is a short book, it's only about 150 pages um, or a little bit above that. But it's a story that absolutely packs a punch. Uh, you can see from the cover why I was drawn to it. The colour palette of this is absolutely perfect and it definitely encaptures the mood that is going on within the story. It has this sort of exotic feel, this idea of some sort of paradise, yet the darkness and the sort of cool yet warm orange that is in this denotes the sort of sense of edginess that you kind of feel when you're reading. This book was very interesting in that it is a retelling of a true story. Now unfortunately, one thing I do think this book was missing was a little bit of context as to what that true story is or why this book was published. But you know, thankfully we have Google, which is definitely what I then went to do after I read this book. And I think I would definitely suggest you looking into the story post-reading the book rather than pre-reading the book um, because it might give away some things as to what goes on within this story. I think the blurb itself definitely caught my attention. It definitely sort of suggested the sort of story that I enjoy. It talks about this like bourgeois desire to escape the city and to kind of live this sort of utopic dream in in an exotic island in which you can enjoy life exactly how you want to enjoy it. And the way that these sort of city dwellers impose their expectations on the island and the life that they lead and how those expectations perhaps don't quite reflect the reality that they then have to endure. It's a story that follows this couple who are both um, extreme leftists yet quite conservative at the same time. It sort of explores this whole notion of what does it mean to be uh, leftist middle-class um, city dweller who do have particular privileges and are almost pampered in some way yet they have this kind of burgeoning desire to to lose these materialistic aspects of their lives and to live on an island yet they don't quite realize just how privileged they once were and how they want to retain that sense of privilege because even on the island their sort of status is in some ways elevated. I think knowing that this book was based on a real story gives you a real sense of the um, author's desire to choose a specific way of telling this story. Um, the writing style within it is short and simple yet very evocative. It gives this sense of um, objectiveness on the author's behalf. He is just relaying um, events to you as opposed to really um, sharing his perception of those events. Yet the language that is used is so evocative and it's really descriptive about lots of specific things that you as a reader um, lose any sense of objectivity and you are completely a subjective witness to the events that unfurl in this book. And I think that's um, a very powerful and interesting way of telling a story and specifically a true story because then you as a reader are um, forced to make opinions and are forced to um, really become emotionally engaged with the story, yet it isn't coloured by the author's own subjective opinion on the story. Of course we cannot deny the fact that the author is telling us a story in a very specific way with the hopes of kind of 
getting particular emotional responses from it. Um, but the way that it is done is, I think, very unique. There is a mood that is very much encapsulated within this book. There are specific um, descriptions of the environment or the food or the sort of cast of characters who are just merely the background to the story being told that really denotes this sense of beautiful images with quite dark and very um, dangerous undertones to them. And that entire, and that sort of theme and that sort of message that is being laced within the words that the author has chosen to suggest these sort of motifs really denotes the, um, the tone of the book in that it is very sparse yet very beautiful. It is telling a story about beautiful people in a beautiful place yet there is this constant unnerving edge to it which you as a reader don't quite know what is happening and you don't quite know what is going to happen. Um, and as the book progresses, um, more and more explicit hints tell you what is going to happen until, pro until right in the middle, where it almost tells you the ending of the story, and things begin to click into place. And then you begin to read the second half of the story um, with a completely different perspective. And those dark hints that you saw in the first half and kind of un were unsettled by, become almost a comfort within the second half and something that you are so um, highly aware of now that they're no longer subtle, they are so explicit and so in your face that it doesn't feel like it's the same story being told, um, which is masterful. It's incredible to see how the author is able to cast those images and cast that desire for a dark, seedy underside to what could be a utopic, beautiful life. Um, in such a way that you as a reader are almost comforted by. There's a particular quote on page 46, which doesn't give any of the story away, but it denotes that feeling of um, the way that beauty and the way that danger um, kind of are combined together in a way that lulls you into a full sense of security. Now this is in the first half of the book um, and it says, even so, the cemetery did not seem sinister. Being so close to the sea, it was frequently flooded during high tides, which left trails of foam. The joyous way in which vegetation crept over the crosses and the tombstones and pushed through cracks in the concrete, the sight of crabs appearing suddenly from sandy tunnels dug into the graves, and iridescent lizards basking in the sun, seemed to Jay to represent the enduring triumph of life over death. Oblivious to the fate foreshadowing his own bones, it occurred to Jay that of all the cemeteries he had ever seen, this particular one terrified him least. And I think that that quote in particular gives you an insight into the way that the author set up the mood of this piece um, and this text. And you're constantly having a barrage of images that are both beautiful and disturbing. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Now, whilst this book and its sentences are sparse, I think the most important part of this text is are the characters themselves and the way that they are developed and the way that they are told within this text. The main couple that we um, follow throughout this book are Jay and Elena. And as I said before, they are both from this almost bourgeoisie world in which they lived and dwelled in the cities of Colombia and have felt almost detached from them and wanted to lead this new life um, out in an island in the Caribbean. Now Jay himself is very much assertive in the fact that he must bring these books with him and these books that he reads throughout the entire book are very indicative of the sort of person he is. He's reading people like um, Bertolt Brecht and Nietzsche and he has this sort of philosophical idea of the the world and what life should be like. He follows a lot of writers who you know sort of denounce capitalism and promote this Marxist idea of life um, and he kind of misses the point of it <laughs> in a way that he wants to live he wants to live within this sort of Marxist utopia without actually having to live the life of a true communist um, lifestyle. And Elena on the other hand she doesn't quite know what she wants and she never really quite knows what she wants she just knows that she's never truly happy in one place or the other she very much has, of the two of them, she is the, very, she is the least idealistic, I suppose. She's very much grounded in reality and she is angry because of that and she is constantly 
angry at everything that is around her because she doesn't know how to find the happiness in the simple pleasures that she thought she might find on the island. And because of her anger, she is cast in a light which kind of juxtaposes with everything else that's going on in this book, this idyllic scene that is being painted for you. And yet towards the end, she becomes the most realistic and the most, um, and the character that you can most sympathise with. Um, because of your attunement to the reality that is actually going on here. She is very insistent that she brings her sewing machine with her and then when the sewing machine is broken at the start of the story, she, it, she is very, um, it, that is very symbolic of like her journey that she's going to be taking throughout the story. Um, and then of course the sewing machine gets fixed and so she just spends a lot of her time either sewing or swimming in the sea and there's not much else that she's willing to do or she wants to do or she believes that she should do. Um, and it's very interesting to see the sort of dynamic between this couple and the way that they both interact um, separately with all the cast of characters in the background, um, specifically the, the people who live on the island um, and the ways that these two interact with these people kind of also helps to define the story that is being told and the mood that is being told to you. Um, I think it's just absolutely wonderful to be able to trace this story um, and I think it's going to be one of those books that is going to be really powerful, it's going to be even more powerful on a reread because you're going to pick up on things that you might not have picked up before. Now I absolutely gobbled the story up within like one sitting, I think I read it over actually two days, um, two sittings I read it in and it was just, it just kept me stuck within this world with these characters, it had me sweltering in the heat of the island but sweltering also within the story and the um, passion of the characters that you find here but also it has me, yeah, but also it had me sweltering with the anticipation of what was coming, where you both knew what was going to happen, but you also didn't know what was going to happen or how it was going to happen. And it made you very tense when reading it, but tense in the best way possible. So I absolutely love this text and knowing the story behind it also has given me a greater, um, a greater enjoyment of it. Um, and I'll read to you the sort of epigraph of this text which both opens the story, but is also used as the final sentences of the story um, in a very powerful way. It says, in the beginning was the sea, all was in darkness. There was neither sun nor moon, no people, no animals, no plants. The sea was everywhere and everything. The sea was the mother. The mother was neither woman nor thing nor nothingness. She was the spirit of that which was to come and she was thought and memory. Now this is a quote from um, some Kogi cosmology, which is a belief system that the author found completely detached from the author's idea of telling this story. But as soon as he read that quote, he knew that that was the quote that was going to anchor the entire story. So hearing those final words of that, knowing what was going to come is also entwined with your memory, really denotes exactly the story that is being told here and denotes a theme that I have noticed a few times in books now and one that I I'm absolutely fascinated by and love seeing explored. So that's all for today and I hope you enjoyed this review and I'll see you next time for another one. Bye bye.